down to you a Merryweather's world. You are almost able to spend all day and all night with me and my lovely co-host, Miniweather. Yay! Yeah, okay. According to Miniweather, I, with this, this shirt, my foraging Texas shirt, she says I look like Shrek tonight, which I'm going to take as a compliment. Okay, another thing you notice, oh, once again, we have no sponsor other than just the regular Foraging Texas, my website. Kind of a bummer. Um, so be it. The show must go on regardless. Being stuff at this point, let's get the show on the road talking about the edible and medicinal aquatic plants of Texas, though most of these plants are found elsewhere too. So if you're turning in from outside of Texas, A, hello, B, I hope it's warm where you're at, and C, this will still benefit you too. Okay. The presentation, oh, this should say part two. I hope this is part two. Let us move on. Ha, it is part two. Excellent. Okay, Lotus. Lotus, a lot of people think of Lotus as a lily pad. It is uh, in the same family, but it has some very distinct differences from your normal lily pad. The first being the size of the pad itself is very large. Uh, you can get almost two feet across on some of them. Also, you notice the pads have a tendency to come completely out of the water whereas the traditional lily pad floats on the surface. Let's move on to the identification. So the leaves of the lily pad, like I said, can be up to almost 24 inches across. They're what we call a peltate structure, which is if you imagine a wheel or a circle with a stem coming right into the center of the bottom of this leaf. So a big round leaf, kind of similar to dollarweed, nasturtiums, other plants where they have a big round leaf with the stem coming up into the center. It is a simple leaf, meaning each stem just has one leaf on it and there's no leaflets or compound leaves going on. It has a palmate vein structure. So starting at the center, think like spokes of a wheel running out from where the stem first hits because you know, the stem is bringing up the nutrients and then these nutrients go outwards through the leaf uh, so think spokes of a wheel. It has what we botanists call an entire edge. If you remember from last week, an entire edge means one that does not have any sort of serrations or tooth. It's just a complete, smooth, linear, no bumps, no lobes sort of thing going on. So those are the leaves. Big flat leaves up, you know, a foot or more above the water. The stem is round and smooth, so no hairs on it. It's just nice and slick and round. And then it will end in a flower uh, that is yellow, fairly large. Well, when it's closed up, I don't know if you can get an idea of my hands. I, I don't have a closed up flower here, but it'll be as big as my hands, and I have big hands. And then it'll open up with seven or more petals, yellow in color, one flower per stalk. If you see a uh, lotus with a pink flower, not a yellow, but a pink flower, those are actually lotus that are from Asia or India. They are not the Native American lotus that has the yellow flower. So we, the native one has a yellow flower, the non-native one has pink. Normally you see the pink one in different water parks and landscaping water features. Um, I don't know why. Okay, so what do you do with the lotus once you have it? Well, there are several things. First off, what don't you eat? Excuse me. You don't eat the leaves, though you can use the leaves as a wrapper for cooking. This is a traditional wrapping for steamed dumplings in dim sum. But again, the the leaf is not eaten, nor is the stem or the flower. None of these parts of the, the lotus are eaten. Now, what you can eat, first off, is the root. If you follow this down, avoiding the alligators and the water moccasins, you will find a traditional lotus root. If you are familiar with the Asian lotus root, it looks like a potato with multiple holes running lengthwise through it. 
that's what the American lotus does too. It's a very large tuber loaded with starch, loaded with calories. Uh, you can roast it like a potato, you can pickle it, you can candy it. Uh, one of my favorite treats uh, years ago, uh, I knew this uh, one Chinese family and the wife always had candied lotus root around, which is basically just thin sliced uh, lotus root soaked in crystallized sugar. So you, it's basically like a sugar coated potato. I mean, that's, just, that's good eating there. Maybe not healthy eating, but tasty eating. So the tuber, like I said, you'll find it under the water. You can pretty much find tubers all year round, which is nice because that makes them a, a fairly consistent source of calories. Now, the other thing you want are the green seeds, or in particular, the nut meat inside these seeds. Um, I apologize right now. So certain people suffer a kind of a fear of things that look like the lotus here. Uh, maybe I should have warned you, but uh, yeah, if you see this... Trichlophobia. Trich trichlo what? Trichlophobia, something like that. But fear of holes. Fear of holes, yeah. So apparently the lotus triggers that. Uh, so you want to get these nuts when the cup holding them is still green, not turned brown, but still green. And if you peel it open, you can see the middle picture there. The nut inside or the large seed inside is still green also. If you peel that and split it in half, so you have to take the shell off and then split it in half, you have the little living plant inside, the germ there, the little green center, you need to take that out too because it is very bitter. Uh, once you've taken that, once you've shelled it and taken the germ out, uh, the best thing really to do is roast it and just uh, kind of like a roasted peanut sort of thing. And from there, you can eat it like a roasted nut. You can grind it into a flour, a gluten-free flour. Uh, you can mash up and boil it, especially roasted. It, it reminds me kind of the old malto meal. Remember the chocolate uh, malto meal that our generation ate a lot of on Saturday mornings and Sunday mornings? Uh, so it, it almost has a vague, I won't say chocolatey flavor, but yeah, well, it has kind of a vague chocolatey flavor because I really can't describe it any other way other than kind of a lotus flavor. So the nut is a really delicious thing. You'll start finding the nut in late summer. Start looking in July. And I said, this is an aquatic plant. It seems to prefer still water, but it does also uh, grow in slow flowing water. So like the Angelina River, I've seen it up there. Uh, if you er are ever driving on I-45, between Houston and Dallas, as you get to Palmer, there is this church, small church on the southbound side of I-45. It has a big cross and numerous billboards with biblical sayings, and they have a huge pond that is absolutely loaded with lotus there. And I've been blessed that he lets me come in and harvest it when I want. Uh, so usually if I'm making a run up to teach in Dallas, I'll swing by there say hi, grab some lotus, and continue on my way. Uh, you also find it down in the Brazos Bend State Park a lot, but be warned down there, it is illegal to harvest it. It is The Brazos Bend is a state park, and unless you can somehow convince A, the park rangers, and B, the alligators to let you in and harvest it, you don't want to mess with the lotus down there. Okay, any questions about lotus? Um, do the nuts get harder to grind the older they get? Yeah, so one thing I found, you've noticed I, I mentioned you want it green. Uh, this is when you want to get them. You want to get them when they're green and then peel them and uh, roast them. Don't let them turn brown. In fact, there's a baggie right there. Yeah. So I don't know if you, well, here we I can do this. Uh, what this is, is a baggie of brown lotus nuts. Thank you. And those are too late to eat. Uh, if you break those open and grind them up and toast them, you can get a, an okay flour out of them, but the flavor isn't so good. And they're very hard and very hard to shell at that point. They're significantly easier to shell and to uh, work with when they're green like this. Now, that being said, those dark ones, those dried ones, those are still viable. 
if you have your own sort of pond around, you can take one of those seeds, the brown ones like I showed you, and what I like to do is I'll rub it on a brick wall for a bit because you need to scar through, you need to kind of break through the outer shell just a little bit. You need to just put a little tiny hole in the outer shell so that the water then can get in to the seed when you throw it in you know, a, a body of water that you own. Now, the neat thing about these seeds is they are viable for over a hundred years, which means if you're local like Marshalls or the other place where they sell dried flowers for flowering arrangement, if they have some of these lotus pods here, like we see on the, you know, the, the well, my left-hand side, I guess it might be your right-hand side, uh, those seeds are very likely still viable. So again, you can just you know, get these seeds from a Michael's or I can't remember the name of the other, what's the other craft store? Michael's then, okay. Well, Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby, yeah. You can go to Hobby Lobby in the dried uh, flower arrangement and they will have lotus and you can spike your pond with lotus and a year from now you'll have lots of food. Also, a year from now, your pond will kind of look like this, where it really has the tendency to take over the pond. So if you are thinking of maybe doing this, uh, keep in mind that if not the first year, by the end of the third year, all you're going to have in there is lotus, uh, which is not great for fishing and things like that. Because this the main purpose of the lotus is to turn small bodies of water back into the land, kind of like cattails, where they'll come in, grow through it, and basically fill it up. And then hopefully during that time, some of their seeds got sent downstream to another oxbow lake or things like that. Okay, any other questions about lotus? Nope. All right, then let us continue on to lizard's tail. Now, lizard's tail is more medicinal than edible. In fact, it's really only medicinal and not really edible. You don't, like, eat it as a salad green or anything oh, like that. Oh, we did oh. get a question. We got a question? All right. Can you plant lotus around creeks or just on ponds? All right, let me go back here. Um, you, it depends on how quickly the water is moving in creeks. One of the issues with the creeks is there's constantly stuff tumbling downstream, you know, branches and things like that, that can damage the young plants. So you really need a very slow moving stream. So any sort of speed, probably not going to happen. But if, especially if you have kind of an oxbow or, you know, sort of thing forming in a stream where it, you know, comes and then dips around and continues on. Uh, you might be okay there, or you might be able to put up some protective cages around it. But it really depends. If you have any sort of rushing water, it will either wash the plant away, or it will hit the plant with enough debris that the plant doesn't survive. Anything else? Okay. Moving back on then to lizard's tail. So lizards. Never mind. One more question. One they more question. The last okay. All right. Can they be close and not actually in the creek? All right. Can they be close? No. They are an aquatic plant. They need their roots in the water. So just being in the mud uh, near the bank isn't going to do it. They really they need to have all that water around them. They don't grow in just the the mud right at the at the edge of the pond. Okay, anything else? Nope, but it'll probably pop out. Okay, soon. well, so all right, moving on to lizard's tail. <laughs> like I said, this, now this plant does grow right on the edge of waters, both still ponds and streams. It may creep just a little, little, little bit into the water, but mainly it stays right on the bank, right on the muddiest part of the bank. And as you can see from these pictures, it forms den dense masses. The name lizard's tail, oops, where is my mouse? There it is, uh, comes from the white clusters of flowers. They kind of, people think they look like the tail of a lizard. So they called it lizard's tail because what better way to name a plant than by what it looks like? 
looking at the leaves, the leaves alternate up the stem. So you'll have a leaf here, and then a leaf there, and then a leaf here, and then a leaf there. Ignore this part of my arm. So think of the leaves as zigzagging up the stem. They are simple, which means you just have one single leaf, uh, no multiple leaflet thing going on attached to the stem. The leaves themselves are heart-shaped, and then they have the palmate vein structure again, where you have multiple big veins all coming from the stem out to the ends of the leaf. And it has the entire edge, the smooth edge with no bumps on it. The stem itself is smooth, no hairs. It can be a bit jointed and angular. Uh, walk like an Egyptian. Uh, you know, so the, the stem will kind of go at angles. The flowers are very small. You know, basically, each little bump here is an individual flower. They grow on a stalk at the end of the branch, and the, it kind of curves over. The Before the flowers open, they are green and tightly packed. And if you imagine a scaly lizard's tail, uh, that's really what the green unopened flowers look like. So what do you do with this plant? Well, the leaves are not eaten, the stem is not eaten, the flowers are not eaten. What you want from this is the roots. Excuse me. And with these roots, you make a sedative tea out of it. So this was a one of the preferred uh, sedatives used especially by Native Americans in the area for colicky children. They would brew some of this tea, soak a bit of leather in it, a rawhide, and give it to the kid to chew on and suck on. And then oof, the kid goes out to sleep. Kind of like the Benadryl trick here. Um, as far as how much, it's a little hard to tell, but... Uh, Basically stick with the standard one tablespoon of this in one quart of water. Boil for 10 minutes. Since it is a root, you can go ahead and boil it and see what happens. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I got a kind of a snort of disbelief over here. Um, so be it. So, no, I've never actually ever gave you any of the lizard's tail. I like you awake. You're a lot more fun than most kids. That's a consoling thought. <laughs> yeah, well. So, uh, the root mainly used as a sedative tea. There was also some uh, historical records of the root being mashed up and being used on chapped skin as kind of a soothing agent on chapped skin especially on a mother who is nursing. Uh, sometimes the nipples can get somewhat chapped, and so they would rub a paste made from the fresh pounded root on them to help them heal better. So lizard's tail, swamp plant. It grows right up to the edge of the water, maybe just a little bit into the water, but it really likes the mud on either side. Uh, the last time I checked uh, here in Houston, which was just this weekend, I know a place where there's a lot of this, it still had not sprouted. Um, but this, it, it pops up in the late spring, grows all summer long. The flowers appear in midsummer, um, but then come winter, it all dies back. And so it all starts over again here. Like I said, probably another month before we start seeing it. As far as when you would harvest the roots, I would wait until the flowers are open um, and then uh, just you know don't take all the roots just take a few all right any questions on lizard's tail is maypop or lizard's tail stronger okay for a sedative effect i would put them pretty much equal uh, yeah maybe the the maypop or the, the passion vine, uh, the leaves of the passion vine, maybe just by a hair. But the main thing, and the reason I'm saying the maypop by maybe just a hair, is the maypop or passion vine is used a lot in commercial teas, where it, as the lizard's tail is very, very rarely used in a commercial tea, now, it could just be that it's a lot easier to collect a whole bunch of passion vine leaves than it is to collect the lizard's tail 
uh, root, especially since in the process of collecting the lizard's tail root, you would kill the lizard's tail, which actually leads me to think then or say that if you have a choice between harvesting passion vine leaves or lizard's tail root for a sedative tea, I would go with the passion vine actually, just because there's a lot more of it around. Anything else? Nope. Nope. Not oh. thus far. Okay, we're going fast tonight. Nutsedge. Sedges have edges. The nut sedges are these kind of, they always remind me kind of of palm trees where you'll have a triangular stem and at the top you'll have long thin bladed leaves like big long leaves of grass and then also coming from the very top you'll have different stalks with tiny little green flowers that turn into tiny little brown seed pods that to produce tiny 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 little seeds. Um, and if you follow it down, I see my daughter waving her hand. Uh, let, let me talk about nutsedge here for a minute, and then we'll, we'll jump back. Uh, so you'll have the triangular stalk with the long blade-like leaves at the top, and then there will be also grass-like blades at the bottom. So let me just show that quick. Uh, I guess you can't really see it there. But the key thing about nutsedges is, like I said, sedges have edges the stalk or the stem of the nut sedge is triangular, which you can see here in the picture of me holding it between my, my fingers. This particular nut sedge was actually fairly rounded. There are some that are downright razor sharp, just very knife-like edges. The leaves, if you look closely at them, they are alternating. Sometimes people will call them whorled. Uh, whorled leaves, if you have a stem, the leaves come out in a circle uh, right around the stem where they're all at the same plane, whereas the alternating, remember, they kind of zigzag around. They are simple leaves, not compounds, so you know it's just one leaflet attached directly to the stem. Parallel veins, so you have, similar to the palmate, you just have a bunch of veins running along the length of the leaf parallel to each other uh, up until the, they get to the edge. And it is an entire edge. So again, no teeth, no serrations, nothing like that. The stem is smooth, no hairs, and triangular, like I mentioned. The flowers are tiny and green, and they form on a cluster or a stalk. So that's the identification of the nut sedge. Uh, was there a question about the... Okay. Um, we're going to jump back to Sorry. the lizard's tail. So. All right. Is that a... Okay. What's a good rule of thumb for measuring the roots when you're boiling the, for the sedative? Okay. Uh, so first off, I recommend letting the root dry. So you would take this root and just hang it up somewhere for... With a root, usually more than two weeks. Uh, give it a thorough washing before you hang it up to dry. You want to make sure there's no mud or dirt or anything like that that's on there. Kind of snip off the little, uh, the little rootlets coming off it, the little hairy roots. I would leave the, the bark on or the skin on on this. Hang it up to dry, probably at least four weeks. Chop it up into, when you're ready to use it, take a bit of the root and chop it up until you have a tablespoonful, like a heaping tablespoon, put that in a quart of water and boil that, and then let it cool down before drinking. I you know, shouldn't have to say that, but if you look at cans of paint nowadays, they actually have uh, warnings not to drink it. Go figure. I don't know if it's like the next Tide Pod thing. So yeah, one tablespoon in one quart of water and see how that affects you and then kind of go up or down a little depending on that any other questions nope okay so running back to nut sedge like i said kind of looks like a little palm tree with big long grassy leaves at the top but the triangular stem is one of the key things here now if you oh so the leaves are not eaten the stem is not eaten the flowers are not eaten what you are after are the little nutlets on the root. Now here's the thing, if you just grab the nut sedge and pull, you will pull the nut sedge plant out of the ground, but each one of those little nutlets is gonna be left behind because they're pretty much designed to easily break off the root and stay in the soil. 
So you actually have to dig up the nut sedge and start filtering through the sand or the soil that it's in. Usually they like nice loose sand, like right along riverbanks. Uh, you know, Spring Creek is loaded with them. Sandy uh, riverbanks and pond edges. Mud, they will grow in mud, but they're a little harder to clean out. So ideally, if you can find them in a sandy area, that will be easier. Also, the sand doesn't seem to push back on this nutlets as they're growing as much so with the same sort of plant i'll find uh slightly larger nutlets in sandy areas than i will in a heavy wet clay area so these nutlets once they are clean you just take them off the plant rinse them off in some water usually some clean water you don't want to use the river water unless you've boiled the river water because you don't want to contaminate the nutlets with any sort of bad bacteria, protozoa that might be in the water. But clean the nutlets and then you can just eat them raw. They have a, they're, they're not crunchy, they're slightly chewy almost. And they have a kind of a sweet almond flavor. Now, if you are allergic to nuts, will you be allergic to this? I don't know. I've never been able to find anything that says yes or no on that. But if you are allergic, especially to peanuts, I would recommend avoiding this just to be on the safe side. So you can eat it raw. You can roast them. And for that, I like just getting a big cast iron pan and stirring them around until they turn a little brown. And then the they taste like roasted almonds. It's really, really good. At that point, you can grind it into a flour. Uh, Kevin Rusk helped me with that at the last Cato Mounds Forage and Feed Feast thing. He had a really great... Uh, grinder that turned them into a lovely powder, a lovely flour that we made an absolutely delicious wild mushroom gravy with. And then the other thing you can do after just chopping them up and boil them to make a, uh, a tea, it's similar to almond milk if you're familiar with almond milk. You can kind of get the same sort of thing from the nut sedge nuts. Uh, another common name for these are tiger nuts. You may have heard them called that somewhere, especially in uh, some of the fancier or uh, you know, non-normal white person <laughs> grocery store sort of thing. Um, I haven't found any at Whole Foods. I thought I found them once at Trader Joe of all places. Uh, but uh, if you find tiger nuts, those are usually the nuts of the nut sedge. Uh, just a historical fact of no importance, papyrus. You remember the Egyptian scrolls were made out of a plant called papyrus. Papyrus is a nut sedge. So they got lots of good fibers from it that they could make their scrolls out of, their paper out of, and food. All right, any questions about nut sedge? Nope. Oh, so I guess I don't have time to get a sip of beer. <laughs> Moving on. Pickerel weed. Okay, pickerel weed. This is a kind of a cool looking plant to me. The leaves kind of look like spearheads. And then the flowers, they put out these stalks of these purple flowers in midsummer that are really, really, really pretty. You'll find this in the wild uh, all over Texas and the south. And then it's also used a lot because of its beauty and it's a long lasting flowers. It's used in water features. If you are driving between Houston and uh, New Orleans, there is a big Cabela's along I-45, uh, sorry, along I-10. And I'm not even sure where it is anymore. Um, it's somewhere past Texas, you know, past Beaumont, past Orange. Uh, somewhere in Louisiana, if I remember correctly, and they had a big water feature in front of their store, and they had lots of pickerel weed in there. So the leaves of the pickerel weed, they are alternating on the stem. So you'll have a leaf, you'll have a leaf, you'll have a leaf, you'll have a leaf. Uh, they are simple, so it's just one leaflet attached to the stem, not compound. Parallel veins again, so like the hand where you have multiple just long straight veins running up from where the, the stem attached. And an entire edge, no teeth, no serrations. The stem itself is smooth, no hairs, and round. The flowers are really pretty. There are several varieties, but the most common is the cordata. Uh, five petals, blue, 
kind of blue purple flowers i'm going to call them blue i was kind of debating back and forth but i'm, I'm i think they're more on the blue side than the uh, purple side maybe that means they're violet uh, i don't know but they grow on a stalk with the lower flowers opening first and then the uh, ones closer to the end of the stalk opening later and then these stalks will be you know six inches long uh, throughout the summer so very pretty very distinctive plant oops okay hey my brother paul's here hey paul oh that reminds me don't let me uh give you an up forget to give you an update on meriwether's league of younger brothers okay so pickerel weed seeds that's what you're after not the leaves you don't eat the leaves not the stem you don't eat the stem not the flowers you don't eat the flowers the seeds the seeds were considered a really delicious treat by the native americans uh, here in the gulf coast region and southern regions southeast regions of north america and they would collect the seeds uh, late summer you can see them here the little brown you know each each flower basically produces a seed they could eat them raw but normally they were roasted and then ground into a flower however the other thing uh, that they would do with them is pop them pop the seeds like pop like popcorn uh, now doing that they don't get like big puffy kernels they just get you know slightly bigger and size wise they're they start out smaller than sunflower seeds I'd say barely half the size of a sunflower seed and then when they pop they get almost the size of a sunflower seed so they don't like it big whoops we have a problem here oh okay we're back I froze there for a second I'm not sure what was going on um anyway yeah so the the seeds the they were popped as well as roasted before eating and they were considered a very nice delicacy actually they have a a tasty thing to me they 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 really do taste like uh roasted corn for lack of a better flavor Sorry, I was rubbing my eye. oh <laughs> it's 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 like a an auction every time she moves it's like a question <laughs> okay so the pickerel weed late summertime is when you want to be looking for the seeds water uh i've seen them again more in still water than in flowing rock flowing water if you have like a, a cow pond or a stock tank or something on your property you can often find the pickerel weed for sale at places that sell plants for water gardens it's very commonly used for landscaping it's native to the area it does great here and it gives you food any questions Not so okay far. i probably should have planned for more plants tonight <laughs> Get to chat more. Okay, next one up. Oh, good. Okay, I can talk lots more. <laughs> so, smartweed. We've talked about this several times over the 22, 21 previous hours of Meriwether's World, now available on YouTube, too. Uh, but smartweed, this is another plant that usually grows right up at the edge of the water, uh, maybe a little bit in the water, but it really likes to have damp, muddy soil to grow. And how do you identify the smart weed? Glad you asked. So, like so many other of the plants we saw recently, it has alternating leaves, so the leaves zigzag up the stem. They are simple leaves, so a single leaflet is attached directly to the stem. They have pinnate veins, so like everything else we were talking ahead, palmate or even our parallel or palmate veins, the pinnate vein, I tell people, think of it as a Christmas tree where you have one main center vein that runs up and then all the other veins come off it. Think branches of a Christmas tree when you are thinking pinnate veins. And if you look really, really, really closely where the leaf attaches to the stem, you will see that the leaf then sends a sheath up the stem. And it was hard to get a good picture of this. I can see it here. Hopefully, if you're looking on a computer, you can see uh, from each leaf, there's a little uh, sheath that goes up the stem. The edge is entire. I think I mentioned that. No teeth, no serrations, nothing like that. The stem is smooth and round, and it has a tendency to kind of angle just a bit at each leaf node. So it's not straight up. It's 
kinked. So it kinks one way, and then the other way, and then the other way, and then the other way, uh, every time a leaf comes off it. No hairs. The flowers are tiny. They grow on a stalk at the end of the branch, or at the end of the stem, sorry. They, if you have the plant branching, it will branch some, but not much. You will get the leaves, or sorry, the flowers ending at the end of each branch, too. So tiny little white flowers. Uh, occasionally you'll see pink ones with kind of a chevron here. That is what we talked about last week, the lady's thumb or the lady's thumbprint, which is in the same family. Uh, but it is fairly distinctive enough that I separate them. So the lady's thumb is basically this plant with pink flowers and a black chevron on the leaf, a chevron being a V shape. Okay, what do you do with the smart weed? You eat the leaves. The leaves, you can use them raw. They are quite high in capsium, the uh, hot spicy molecule found in hot peppers. So think of these as leafy hot peppers. And they're used the same way, you know, wherever you would use a hot pepper, really. So, you know, as a seasoning to add Caps, yeah, capsi, <laughs> capsicum <laughs> to your food. Uh, you can eat the stem raw too. The flowers traditionally aren't eaten, and I've never found any records of the flowers being, being eaten, but at the same time, I've never found any record of the flowers being toxic, and I've known throughout classes, people ask, can I eat the flowers? And I say, "There's, I've never seen any reason not to. Um, but those who have eaten the flowers say, yeah, the flavor is just kind of eh, nothing spectacular, not the hot spicy that the, the smart weed itself has. And if you can find them, the seeds are generally not eaten either. I've been trying to get smart weed seeds. It seems like there's a short, very short period of time between when the flowers go away and the seed pods form and the seed pods open and drop the seeds. It's like I said, I've been trying for years to get smartweed seeds to try and grow in my yard. Um, I'd have to do a lot of watering, but I'm willing to do that because I really like smartweed. So the caps, capsicum also has medicinal properties. So the leaves are the main use or main way of acquiring this molecule. That capsicum is an antifungal agent. In fact, they found that the main purpose for growing that or producing that molecule is to protect the plant from fungus, which means if it is growing in a wet, muddy area, more likely than not, it's going to produce a lot more than in a place that's a bit more sunny and dry. So if you think about it, the wetter the plant, or the wetter the area the plant is growing, very likely the hotter it will be. Now this capsicum, it also increases blood circulation. Uh, one of the things growing up in Minnesota we used to do in the winter, or at least I used to do, is I'd grab some of the chili powder from uh, the kitchen and rub it on my feet before putting on my socks and boots and going outside. And what that does is it causes the capillaries to open up, to dilate. And so you get more blood flowing to the surface of your skin. So the surface of your skin is warmer. However... This also means you are set up to lose heat more rapidly, too. So if you're doing this, you want to do it, you know, if you're doing it just to stay warm, you want to make sure you still have a lot of insulation around you so that the, the heat from the blood vessels just doesn't go off into the atmosphere. It stays trapped in the boot or the mittens or something like that. Uh, those of you who have taken my medicinal workshops, we've always made the capsium uh, salve that is used to help deal with muscle and nerve pain. And basically what it does is it's kind of like the, if you're familiar with Icy Hot, it's the hot part of Icy Hot. And that rubbing it on a area like a back pain area or nerve pain area, it basically overstimulates the nerves and uses up the chemical that the nerves use to signal pain. So after a while, they just go, I give up. Nope, there's no pain here. There might be all sorts of damage and infl inflammations and stuff, but I'm out of the pain trigger molecule. 
So now if you have deep chronic pain, like the sort of thing, you know, morphine or oxytonin or something like that is uh, recommended for, not thinking it'll help out much with that, but just uh, like the pains of a 50 year old body, um, it helps with that quite a bit. So with this, you can make it into a salve, a infused oil or a liniment. Uh, the salve, well, the oil, you, you basically dry the leaves and do a hot infusion of the leaves into something like sunflower oil or a safflower oil or grapeseed oil. You can use olive oil, but the sunflower seed oil and the grapeseed oil uh, are better skin penetrants than the olive oil. Uh, but to do this, you basically get yourself a, you know, quart jar take let the leaves dry for two weeks because you want the the holes to form in the cell walls put them about half full in the jar and then add oil uh, so the jar is full so it's like this much plant and this much oil so equal amounts you know there's going to be oil in amongst the plants but oil on top too seal it up bring some water to a boil around nine o'clock in the evening turn the water well set the jar in the boiling water and immediately turn off the heat and then just let it sit in there overnight in the hot hot water the oil and the leaves will heat up the water will cool down but you'll get what we call brownian motion the, you know everything will be moving really quickly from the heat and so the caps uh, capsicum and the other molecules that you're after will kind of work their way out of the leaves you do that three nights in the row in a row with the same jar so three nights in a row, you want to take that jar, set it in boiling water, and then turn off the heat and let it sit there overnight in the warm water and let it just cool naturally. After three days, you'll have done a pretty good job of extracting the capsicum. And so you strain out the plant material. And then really, you probably want to store this in the refrigerator just to keep it fresh. But it should be you know, pretty shelf stable. Uh, if you, instead of an oil, you want to uh, make an actual salve or an ointment, then you want to start mixing melted beeswax into it and you know, basically melt the beeswax, warm up the oil some, pour the beeswax in, stir it up. Uh, I recommend starting with 14 grams of beeswax per two cups of the infused oil and see what the consistency is there once it's all well mixed up and cools down. Uh, if it's still too greasy, you can add more wax. If it's too hard, you gotta remelt it and mix in some more of the infused oil. A uh, liniment, that just is a tincture, an alcohol tincture made with a non-consumable alcohol. Now, the only consumable alcohol is ethanol from a molecular point of view. Um, so a liniment is made with, say, isopropanol, usually uh, like a rubbing alcohol or, yeah, yeah mainly just the isopropanol, um, which has kind of the same dissolving ability of ethanol, but you cannot drink it. Remember, the isopropanol is poisonous to consume, but it's okay to rub on your skin. That's why they call it rubbing alcohol, and it will help... Uh, lay the capsicum in and help it get into your nerves and kind of settle things down. Okay, a lot of information. Any questions? Oh, good. We have questions, which means I can have a sip. Is lady's thumb or smartweed hotter? Okay, is lady's thumb or smartweed hotter? It really varies more on the growing condition than the... Um, the, the species, if you will. Of the two, normally the lady's thumb, it likes, or it can at least handle sunnier areas than the smartweed can. Uh, the smartweed usually likes shady, wet areas, whereas the lady's thumb you'll find in sunny, wet areas. And so just Going back to the whole, the capsicum is a, an antifungal. You might have a bigger issue with fungus in a shady area. So if I had to guess, 
I would say the shady grown smart weed might have slightly more capsicum in it, but I've never had a chance to do a side by side taste comparison. So it's basically just a swag or a scientific wild ass guess as to the smart weed being hotter. Anything else? Is the stem spicy too? The stem is spicy, but not as spicy as the leaves. Uh, again, another scientific wild-ass guess, because I'm full of these, but based on years of study, um, the leaves are more likely to suffer damage than the stems, just because the stems are tougher. And so the plant wants to make sure that the leaves are protected more from any sort of fungal infection than the stem. So, but just from simple taste testing, yeah, the, the leaves have a higher, uh, slightly more noticeable level of capsicum in it than the stems. Anything else? Can smart weed be infused with DMSO? All right, I knew someone was going to ask that. Yes? Who was that? Who was that? Uh, I don't quite remember. Oh, okay. Yeah, so if you get your hands on DMSO, we talked about DMSO uh, a number of weeks ago, and that the DMSO has a very special magic power that it is absolutely excellent at penetrating human skin, and anything that is dissolved in the DMSO will ride with it uh, and be absorbed too. Uh, I remember back in the 80s, it was very common for uh, long-distance runners to crush up aspirin, dissolve them in DS DMSO, and then rub them on sore knees and sore ankles and hips and so forth and would get really almost instantaneous relief. Uh, my dad still uses a DMSO-based horse liniment type stuff, pain reliever, on his back. He's had you know, decades of back issues. Uh, that he really, that he really swears by. That being said, uh, DMSO, there are some cautions. There is, um, it's not the best molecule for your body. It's not the worst, but long, consistent, daily, multiple daily use of it. Uh, it can lead to health hazards. Uh, the biggest being there is a slight uptick in cancer. So it's really something that I re would recommend for you know, just once a week or so, just in you know, extreme cases rather than a daily wear. Even though, like I said, my dad is using it pretty much daily for decades, but still, um, he has incredibly good genes. So I think he's pretty much resistant to cancer. Knocking on wood, praying to God. Uh, anything else? Another one. Yes. Which horse liniment? Oh, um, ask me after class. I actually took a picture of it um, because it was so good. Uh, I want to say, so he's up in Minnesota, and he gets it at Fleet Farms. It's kind of like a tractor supply uh, store up in, the, up in the Midwest there. Now, it's, it's called a horse liniment, but it's also, you know, can be used on humans. I can't remember now if the label, if it, you know, warned against using it on humans or if they winkingly said good for humans too. But uh, I will look it up and I will try and figure that out. Excuse me, for you. Is there others? What season does this grow? <laughs> All right. This is a summertime uh, plant. I've already seen it growing uh, now. So really, it grows all year until a really hard freeze knocks it down. Uh, during the winter months, it can look kind of ratty tatty because it stops putting out new leaves and the, the leaves that are on there get kind of beat up. But starting now and you know through Thanksgiving, it's going to be around, like I said, in the wet areas. It doesn't grow necessarily in the water, but it grows right up to the edge. Any others? Nope. All right. Moving on. Wow, 8.51. I need to keep track of the time here. Okay, actually, I think this is the last one I had up uh, for today. The spatter dock, also known as the water lily. This is the most common water lily probably in North America. Uh, when people think water lilies, this is what they're talking about. 
And I will tell you right now, if you are reading some sort of survival book, like, oh, say, the U.S. Military Guide to Wilderness Survival type thing, or survival, I can't remember what field manual it is, but the, it talks about eating the root of this. Uh, a number of other books talk about reading the root to this. Let's talk about eating the spatter dock. So, but before that, of course, identification. The leaves are heart-shaped. Remember, the lotus were round, a complete circle, whereas the uh, spatter dock actually has a cleft in it. If you uh, remember, ponies flip mentioned way back, for those of you who have been watching since day one, uh, the spatter dock, think of it as heart-shaped because it has that deep cleft in it. It has pinnate veins, so it has one center vein, and then all the other veins come off that one center vein. An entire edge, so no, uh, no teeth, no serrations. It's all just one single line. And generally, it will be floating on the surface of the water. If you get a really drastic drop in the amount of water present, uh, it can end up above the water, but normally it's floating right on the surface. The stem is smooth and round. The flower uh, is kind of distinctive. It looks like a yellow golf ball almost. It's uh, not quite the size of a golf ball. It's about an inch across. I think yeah, if you go back one. Uh, and then how many petals did it? Oh yeah, five petals. So it has an odd number of petals, but they'll have this, this stalk sticking out randomly around where the, the lily pads are. Uh, the flowers will be start showing up in late summer, or sorry, late spring, and new ones can appear all summer long. Okay, so eating the leaves, not eaten, don't eat the leaves. The stem, not eaten, don't eat the stem. The root, not eaten, and you will see an exclamation point there. Because in a lot of wilderness survival books and so forth, they actually talk about eating the spatter dock root, the tuber. It forms these big, thick, it looks like an octopus's tentacle, really. The flower is not eaten, and the only edible thing on here are the seeds. And so after that yellow ball flower matures, it f forms a kind of a... a a seed pod that looks a lot like a poppy seed uh, seed pod, or think of it like almost like an okra turned upside down. And inside it, there'll be up to five seeds, and those roasted are pretty good. But the root absolutely sucks. Yeah, let me talk about the root here, because especially in the uh, military U.S. military survival guide, it talks about you dig up the water lily root, you peel it, and then either roast it or boil it, and then eat it, and life is good, and you, you have calories, and everything is honky-dory. This is not true. Uh, what they did is they copied information from the lotus root and applied it across the board to all water lilies, and that does not work. If you dig up the spatter dock root, and you peel it, and you boil it, and you eat it, you are going to throw up. It tastes that terrible. Uh, working with military people, this was something. They said, oh, in our guide, it says you can boil it or roast it and eat it. And so we boiled it, they ate it, threw up. So we took some more, roasted it, ate it, well, peeled it, roasted it, ate it, threw up. And then I tried boiling it, then roasting it, ate it, threw up. So then they thought, well, okay, let's roast it, then boil it, then eat it, and they throw up. There was never any way we could find to eat the, the root of the water lily. It was just so horrible and bitter and nasty and sickening uh, that it just caused you to throw up. So I tell people, if you're reading some bushcraft book or something like that, and it talks specifically about the spatter dock or the water lily as the root, as a food store, so you may want to question if they've tried it or not. Now, the seeds, like I said, uh, that appear after the flower in a kind of a poppy-like uh, seed pod, those are good, especially once they're roasted. But the root is absolutely terrible. Okay, so that is all I had for the presentation. Do we have any questions? We do not. No questions. There all right. There is a question unrelated to this, though. Okay. 
How did you get the nickname Blast? Miss Jackie Jackson is here and mentioned. <laughs> okay. Hi, Jackie. I've known Jackie, what, 20 years now? Um, and I'm pretty sure she knows the story. But since the Statue of Limitations is up and we have a few minutes, uh, let's talk about that. So Blast was my nickname given to me uh, way back in undergraduate in my senior year of college at South Dakota State University. And for many, many, many years, it has been my name on different Usenet groups and things like that, where we discuss, you know, fighting zombies and so forth. So where did it come from? Um, my daughter is laughing because she knows this story. The, uh, I'm a chemist. And nine times out of ten, the reason a person becomes chemists is because they get a thrill out of blowing things up. <laughs> and being a chemist, that was the main reason I ended up going into chemistry is because of the different sciences, it had the coolest explosions. And uh, actually, it was my freshman year of high school, or sorry, freshman year of college, where I got a hold of a military manual called Improvised Munitions Handbook. This particular military manual was given or used to train different military members whose purpose is to go behind enemy lines and sabotage stuff. So it has all sorts of interesting recipes on how to make stuff from easy to acquire chemicals. Um, there was one in particular I really, really liked because it was really, really easy to make. And it didn't give huge explosions, but it gave really entertaining explosions. And so it was very common for me to have a pound or more of this sitting on my desk in my dorm room uh, in college. And one fateful afternoon, I had a pound of it sitting there on my desk in college. And some of my friends came in and saw it and were, you know, what's that stuff? Is, you know, and I said, you know, oh, check this out. This is really cool. So I took an ashtray went way over to the center of the room, put three little grains of this in there and touched it with a match and it went poof and time stopped. Actually, it didn't stop. It did not stop. It slowed down and I knew exactly what was going to happen because I could just see. Now, go sideways here for a second. There are two creatures that they've shown on this planet, on planet Earth, that can calculate the... A parabolic arc of an object flying through the air. It is humans and dogs. That's why dogs can catch frisbees. Cats can't. Monkeys can't. No one but humans and dogs can predict where something is traveling, you know, where it's going to land in a parabolic arc. And I saw exactly where one of those burning grains was going to go. Like I said, time slowed down. It was like, you know, just moving in slow motion. I knew exactly that it was going to land in the pound of stuff. And rather than try and stop it, because I knew I couldn't, I jumped up and took the, the smoke detector off the ceiling and shoved it under my shirt. About the time I was doing that, the grain hit the pound of homemade explosives and it all went off. And a huge purple roaring volcano of <laughs> awesomeness. No, wait, no, bad, bad. Um, so we're in a normal dorm room. It's, it's what, maybe 10 feet by 10 feet square, eight, nine foot ceilings. And it took probably 15 seconds for this to burn. Big purple flames. Uh, during that time, well, when it ended, you couldn't see anything in the room. There was so much smoke, you could not see your hand this far in front of their face. It was just pure smoke. Uh, Sunday afternoon, probably around 2, 2.30, um, all I could hear were my friends actually rolling on the floor, laughing their asses off. I couldn't see anything, but they were rolling on the floor laughing um, because I had just blown a hole through my desk. There is more to that story, um, but that is limited to campfire type activities. So, but... Ever since then, my nickname was Blast. The whole Meriwether thing didn't show up until years later when I was out with my hiking buddies. 
Okay, so uh, I am going to end it here, unless there are any other questions. There's a wisdom or update on League of Brothers. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah, so the uh, Meriwether's League of Younger Brothers. Uh, I've gotten the list together. It's sitting on my boss's desk. When she will finally get around to going through and picking the people, I don't know. I keep bugging her on it. Um, but I was really hoping by the end of this week we'd have stuff shipped out, but that's not going to happen. So those of you who that contacted me and reached out to me, yes, uh, I'm still trying to get you know, the upper management do what they said they wanted to do. And then, uh, I know we're running late here, but you know, I'm going to save the words of wisdom for next week. So at this point, I guess if... Oh, 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 you got to come right, closer right, this I way. See how it is. Uh -huh. All right. Bye bye, everyone. We will bye. see you next week, next Wednesday at 8. Bye.